This is an introduction to the Gaussian Beams Lab for the Intermediate Lab class. For those of you who have had optics, this will be a, an overview of what you've done, what you remember from class. For those of you who have not had optics, there will be a lot of material that will be new, and we will emphasize the parameters that you need to know and how to use them. The learning outcomes of the lab are to become familiar with Gaussian beams, because we'll use Gaussian beams for for um, all or at least most of our optics experiments, and to illustrate how Gaussian beam propagation theory can predict the beam behavior, but only when it's paired with good measurements. The lab objectives are the things that you will finish, that you will do by the end of the lab. The lab objectives for this lab are to do a series of measurements to obtain the waste, W0, of the beam coming from the laser, and its Rayleigh range, and then to compare the measured Rayleigh range with your predicted Rayleigh range. Two, you'll focus the beam and use the previous type of measurement to get a measurement of the beam waste after the focus. So we'll be emphasizing the beam waste measurements and the propagation, uh, the Rayleigh range. Let's start with a quick introduction to the laser. Most of you know that laser stands for light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. And the important parts of a laser or features of laser light are that it's monochromatic or one color. You should know the wavelength of the laser that you're working with. It's always written on the laser and you can also measure it. The a laser beam is collimated, which means it travels more or less as a narrow beam, although it does diverge, which is actually exactly what you're measuring in this lab. Our laser is polarized, which means it has a defined electric field direction. And in red here is the mode, because the Gaussian beam refers to the mode of the laser, and that means that it has a defined intensity profile. So in this picture, we have a laser source, like a box, and a beam comes out of that laser source. If you were to look at the front view of that beam, it would look like the picture on the right, where it's more intense in the center and less intense on the outside. So a Gaussian beam is a laser beam that propagates with a Gaussian intensity profile. A Gaussian is actually a mathematical function. Um, the intensity profile looks like this kind of bright red in the center, more intensity in the center of the beam, and less on the outside. And if a beam is traveling in the z direction, let's say the z direction is out of the page, then the intensity would go like i of r, the intensity or radiance, equals i naught, the maximum intensity, times e to the minus 2 r squared over w squared, where r is a square root of x squared plus y squared. The parameter w is the beam half width. The half width is actually the the radius at which the beam goes to one, the intensity of the beam goes to 1 over e squared. The electric field goes as 1 over e at the beam half width. We can figure out what that beam size w is by measuring how much of the light goes through an aperture of a particular size. So if we place an aperture in the beam like this that blocks all of the light around it and only passes light through the center, we can measure how much power is contained in the center. And for an aperture with a radius equal to W, what we know is that the intensity goes as I naught, the maximum intensity, e to the minus 2, and the total power is the maximum power, the, the total power going in the contained in the beam times 1 minus e to the minus 2 and that's equal to 0.86 times the total power the initial power this is an equation that you're going to come back to as you make your measurements again it says that the total power through an aperture when the aperture has a beam has a size equal to w the total power will be 0.86 times the uh, power contained in the entire beam. So think about how to use that to measure the beam size. Alright, we're going to go back to some basics about Gaussian beams. The, a Gaussian beam is an electromagnetic wave. 
And we know that any electromagnetic wave, traveling electromagnetic wave, satisfies the differential wave equation. This is partial squared psi with respect to x squared equals 1 over v squared, where v does represent the speed of the wave, partial squared psi with respect to t squared. Now when we're dealing with three dimensions, the wave equation instead looks like this. Del squared psi equals 1 over v squared partial squared psi with respect to t squared. Where that del in this case is, is the Laplacian. That symbol is used for a lot of things. Here this means the Laplacian. Del squared equals a sequence of partial derivatives with respect to x, y, and z. So it's a three-dimensional wave equation. Our Gaussian beam will need to uh, satisfy the three-dimensional wave equation. So what we do is we suppose we've got a Gaussian beam function and we substitute it into the three-dimensional wave equation. We make some simplifications that are necessary and solve for the propagation of this wave in order to evaluate particular constants and parameters of the beam. So that all sounded like kind of complicated because we're not actually going to go through the details. So it does, it is kind of complicated. I suggest you look at a text that goes through the Gaussian beam derivation. In our case, we're going to suppose that our Gaussian beam is something like this, psi of x, y, z, and t equals an amplitude a, function of x, y, and z, times e to the i k dot r minus omega t plus phi. We'll substitute this into our three-dimensional wave equation and make simplifications, and then we learn a bunch of things. One thing we learn is the amplitude. And the amplitude a, we discover, is this complicated function of the beam size, which is a function of z, and x and y. In other words, if you point to any point in space at x, y, and z, you can determine the amplitude of the wave based on this function. We also want to know about the phase. So to see how the phase propagates, we substitute our Gaussian beam into the wave equation, and we get a phase that looks like this. Let's assume that phi was initially zero. So our e to the i k dot r minus omega t becomes a rather complicated function of x and y and z. Um, we can break this into two terms. One looks like a, a typical e to the i kz minus omega t for our wave traveling in the z direction. And the other is a function of x and y and the radius of curvature r. So this is the phase of the wave. Now we've got our whole Gaussian beam, which has an amplitude and a phase term that are like this. So this, this initial term tells us about the amplitude of the wave at any point in space, and the phase term tells us about the phase at any point in space. We can then find the values of w and r, actually, from this expression. And we'll talk about those now. So W and R are important to us because they tell us about the radius of curvature of the beam, which means how tightly is it focusing or expanding, and the beam size. So the goal of the next three slides is to calculate the beam parameters at every point as the beam propagates. Let's start with the Rayleigh range. This defines the distance at which the beam size, w of z, is equal to w naught, the smallest beam size in that region, times square root of 2. So to give you an idea of what that is, if w naught was the beam size right here where my cursor is, then right here at the dotted line, the beam size would be w naught times the square root of 2. In other words, a bit larger. And this distance is defined as the Rayleigh range. It gives us information about how quickly our beam diverges. A small Rayleigh range diverges very fast. A big Rayleigh range doesn't change very, very quickly. All right, our beam size, or spot size or beam waste, all appropriate words, is a complex function of z and the, the smallest beam size. 
and we'll see a simpler version of this in a in a not in a moment. And the radius of curvature is the curvature of the wave fronts, r of z. It tells you how quickly the wave fronts are converging and therefore how quickly the beam will focus. It's also a function of z and the Rayleigh range. In certain conditions, if z is quite large, in other words, if it's much larger than the Rayleigh range, then r of z is approximately z. That's really nice, that the radius of curvature is approximately z the distance from the smallest beam size. And we can relate R1 and R2 like this. We will not need to do that in this particular lab. The beam waste is located at a particular point. And once again, we can make approximations and find that for a collimated beam, the beam um, z is approximately r, and if we have a beam going through a lens, the distance to the beam waist is approximately f. So if we have a collimated beam entering our lens, distance to beam waist here is approximately equal to the focal length of the lens. The beam waist itself is the minimum spot size at a focus, and in a particular condition, we'll find that the beam waist is equal to lambda r over pi times w. This picture shows you what w is and w naught, where w naught is the, is the beam waist and w is the beam size at a lens. Those are all of the parameters you'll need. Use this next section of the video to learn about the equipment for the lab and instructions for using it. This is your introduction to the equipment for the Gaussian beams experiment. So we have, I'll lay out what's on the table on this breadboard and then tell you some of what you're going to do uh, as you get started with this experiment. We have a laser. This is called the laser head. It's the actual helium beyond laser and it's connected to a power supply. So this cable takes us to a power supply, which is right here. The laser head is the light comes out at this end. Um, what we are going to do first is turn on the laser. So we see that the power supply is plugged into a power strip, which is that plugged into the wall. We turn the key into the on position. And before you turn a laser on, it's usually, it's always good to know that the laser beam is not going to be shooting around the room in unexpected directions. This laser beam won't uh, it is not high enough power to cause immediate damage. But, so here we go. We'll turn the key, the key switch, which is under where my finger is. Card in place in front of the laser head. And a spot appears on the card that's red, and that is our, our laser beam. All right, so now our laser is on, and we can figure out what we need to do with it. The first thing you're going to do that's your, your instructed in the lab is align the beam down the table. So this is learning basic laser use skills. And what we have here is two mirrors. We have one mirror that's right here in front of the laser head and another mirror that's set just down the table, the breadboard from the first mirror. These are both turning the beam 90 degrees. So after this mirror, beam is now going in this direction. What we'd like to do is align the beam in a straight line down the table. I, I can't really tell just by looking if it's going in a straight line. So what I use is an aperture. This is an aperture. It has an opening. You have the ability to open and close the aperture. And the way it's set up, you can adjust the position. We'd like to keep the height the same. We're not going to adjust the height. And in fact, right now it's set up for us uh, in, in a good position. So we're going to check that the beam is traveling in a straight line down the table by seeing that it goes through an aperture at this end of the table. And then if we move that aperture down here, we would like it to go through that aperture again. It isn't right now. So we're going to 
adjust our mirrors, our mirror pointing until the beam is going through the aperture. What you will do is you'll adjust this mirror to go through the aperture at this end of the breadboard. And then you'll move the aperture down here and adjust this mirror. You can adjust the vertical and the horizontal position to go through the aperture here. You'll then have to iterate, which means repeat, adjust this mirror at this end, move it down here, adjust this mirror at the far end, until the beam is going through the aperture in both places. Now you know that it's going in a straight line down the table. So the first step is basic alignment techniques. The second part of your lab is to determine the, the beam size coming out of the laser. We'll call that the starting beam waist. We're going to use the same aperture. Uh, we may need to, you may need to adjust the height a bit now. And you will use, the, you'll close down the aperture. I'm going to demonstrate over here because you can kind of see the beam and the equipment instead of hiding behind the laser. Right now you see light on the card. If I close down the aperture, it gets dimmer. Right? I'm blocking the beam with the aperture. What I'm going to do is measure the power going through an aperture at a certain, when it's completely open, in other words, all of the light going through the aperture. And then I'm going to close it down until only 86% of the power is going through the aperture. And at that point, if it's centered, at that point, my aperture size will be the size of the beam waist. This is written in your lab instructions. So what I just said, you can see in the early part of the video and also in the lab instructions, how to measure the beam waist. So you will measure the beam waist at the, at the out opening of the laser and then also find the Rayleigh range of the beam out of the laser. And then the next part, so once you've done all that, which will take a while, the next part is to focus the beam with the lens, and we can put different lenses on the end of this, uh, of this um, lens holder. We're gonna focus the lens, the beam, through a lens. This isn't quite going through the center, but good enough. And measure the focus beam spot size. I'll have more techniques to tell you in lab about how to find the focus of the beam and, um, and using the lens. Okay, so this is your lens in your lens holder. The last piece of the equipment that you need to know about is the power meter. So the power meter head looks like this. This is the sensor part that responds to photons, responds to energy. It's connected to a controller or a meter that actually reads the head. So you put the power meter head in the beam so your, your light is on the power meter. You can adjust the height of the power meter head until it, the light hits the center of the power meter. And this is connected to our computer, and you will see the readout, the display of the power meter. All right, so that is the overview of the equipment. Expect to have questions about how to use the pointing, and particularly how to make this measurement. So talk with each other and ask me for help. The pre-lab questions are here and also in the lab sheet. Write these questions and your answers in your notebook. One, consider when a collimated beam is focused with a lens of focal length f, its focused beam waist is determined by several parameters. To make a small beam waist, do you think you want a longer or a shorter focal length lens, and why? And also, which is going to give you a longer Rayleigh range? Is E sub R a long focal length lens or a short focal length lens and why? These questions can guide your viewing of this video. So if you go back through and look for the answers to these questions, that will help you to focus on particular parts of the video.
Be sure when you get to the lab that you sketch the experimental setup by sketching the beam path for the experiment and showing optics, the particular optics involved.